Welcome back. My name is Eric Jarvis. I'm an associate professor at the Duke University Medical Center and also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. And we are talking about brain pathways for uh, vocal learning behavior, you know, the, which is the ability to imitate sounds, including uh, speech. And in part three of my presentation, we're going to talk about uh, some knowledge we've gained recently about the genes that are involved in functions of vocal learning circuits and genes that have specialized behaviors in these circuits. And the first one I want to talk about is called FOXP2. In humans, when the FOXP2 gene is mutated, we lose the ability to appropriately produce normal speech. Uh, we go, ah, ba, how are you? It's hard to sequence phonemes together. And so <clears throat> that was the first gene that was discovered for that ability and itself is a gene that regulates the synthesis of other genes. My lab and several other labs have actually looked at the FOXP2 gene in the songbird brain and here's what it looks like in a zebra finch. Uh, here again is the forebrain and here is the basal ganglia. FOXP2 is expressed at high levels in this basal ganglia region called the striatum, the white signal here. It's also on the thalamus and at a young age it's pretty high including in this area exon nucleus. And when a juvenile zebra finch gets to become uh, what we call this juvenile subsong stage of singing, uh, FOXP2 goes up to higher levels in area X, and then when he becomes an adult, it comes down. And shown down here, you know, is the age of those animals at hatching. Here is your juvenile. Here is this uh, the juvenile, what we call the subsong. And he's not imitating well the song of the adult tutor. This is a male who is singing to a... Uh, uh, two -team. But when he's an adult, that juvenile becomes an adult and gets his orange cheek patch and all his nice colored feathers, he sings a well-imitated song. And so uh, <clears throat> FOXP2 expression is going up during that imitation process and it goes down. So this is interesting. What my colleagues Sebastian Hessler and uh, Constance Scharf did is to inject an inhibitor of FOXP2 into the area exon nucleus. It's called an RNAi inhibitor. It binds to the mRNA product of FOXP2 and prevents it from being made into a protein. Uh, what you see down here is called a Western blot, and you have a control knockdown where uh, it's not the FOXP2 gene, some other gene, and FOXP2 is still synthesized. When you put an RNAi to FOXP2 inside of area X, you prevent the protein synthesis. Uh, other genes are not affected. And this is just showing a quantification of it being knocked down. So <clears throat> when they did the control knockdown and gave an animal a tutor, this is what uh, we see. So, so here is uh, the song of the tutor. And you can hear it's a sequence of five different syllables. And now here is the song of a 2T that grew up with this tutor. And if you listen to that, they sound quite similar. It's a good copy. Now here's a song of another tutor, again with about five different syllables. And now we're going to play the song of the uh, 2T with the Fox P2 knockdown. Okay, you heard that? Okay, go ahead and play it again. And what you can hear is that, yes, the bird is still singing, but he hasn't quite imitated the song that well. He's imitated individual syllables, but he produces them out of sequence. And some of those syllables, like the syllable D here, is not a good match of the syllable D here. And we're just going to show a longer example here, play the, the tutor song. And now play the uh, 2T song with the Fox P2 knockdown. Did you hear that? Play it again. So basically what it shows is that FOXP2, like in the human brain, is not necessary for actual speaking, or in this case singing, but it's necessary to actually imitate the songs appropriately. And what we think is really happening here is that FOXP2 might be controlling certain kinds of connections in the brain. And so we begin to ask the question, what are the genes that FOXP2 regulates? And one of the genes that FOXP2 regulates 
is an, what we call an axon guidance molecule called SLIT1. The human version of SLIT1, I mean the human version of FOXP2, regulates this neural connectivity gene differently than the chimpanzee version. What about in songbirds? Well, we have looked at the SLIT1 gene in songbirds and the receptor which the SLIT1 gene binds to in one of the SOL nuclei, in this case the RA nucleus, that sends a projection out of the forebrain to the brainstem. And what we find is that in all vocal learning birds, the RA nucleus has down regulation of SLIT1 compared to the surrounding brain areas in a songbird, a hummingbird, and a parrot. And what's more interesting about the parrot is that uh, it has two parts to its motor uh, learning nucleus. One part that makes a projection down to the vocal organs for controlling uh, vocal behavior, and another part here that connects up to other brain areas for vocal behavior. It's only the part that makes that specialized connection to the vocal motor neurons that actually has the specialized gene regulation. And if you look at the brain of a non-vocal learning animal here, such as a ring dove and a quail, you can see that they don't have these brain areas of low gene regulation for this axon guidance molecule. So we think that this connection here might be associated with specialized regulation of this SLIT1 gene. And this is uh, new data that we're working on now. It's unpublished, but it's something that gives you a teaser of what's to happen next. And our hypothesis is, is that if we can control these neural connections through down-regulating or up-regulating these genes in vocal learning circuits in a non-vocal learning species, maybe we can control its vocal learning behavior. So I'm going to summarize here to put this in a broader context, to think about how these brain circuits evolve. We like to think of the brain as something special. But what I'm suggesting from our hypothesis is that the way brains evolved is much like the way other organ systems evolved. For instance, in the evolution of wings, um, <clears throat> what is thought to have happened is wings evolved three times independently, if not more, in uh, birds, bats, ancient flying dinosaurs uh, who are petrels. And basically, what has happened is that each time the wings evolved at the sides of the body, at the center of gravity, so when the bird flies, in this case, the Earth's gravitational force is pulling at the center of the body, so you don't want to evolve one wing on the head, one wing on the tail, or on the back or the chest. This is the most energetic way to fly. If there's a mutation in the genome that accidentally puts a wing-like structure on the head, uh, then the bird is not going to survive. Then each time wings evolve, it also used the upper limbs here, so the arms in these uh, uh, different animals. So there was a pre-existing substrate. I argued that in the brain, like the evolution of wings, there's a pre-existing substrate. That is the brain pathways controlled motor sequence behavior. All right? Whereas um, <clears throat> in the wings, it's the arms. So we have a pre-existing substrate, which we call a deep homology. And then it becomes either uh, useful for another st structure, like the wings, or even duplicated, I'm suggesting, for vocalizations. For the evolution of wings here, I mentioned there's a genetic constraint, which is the upper limbs uh, here, uh, that led to the evolution of these wings. And the epigenetic constraint is the center of gravity. Is there such an epigenetic constraint for the brain? And my answer has been possibly yes. Uh, and shown here is one such hypothesis. Uh, all vocal learners use their learned vocalizations to try to attract mates and do so by generating a complex syntax of vocalizations. So that is, they sequence their sounds in a complex way. And this idea came to me one day when I was uh, sitting out in the park at Duke University reading a uh, paper and there is this song sparrow sitting at the top of a tree uh, singing a song going <laughs> and he was doing that for 15 minutes. So I first noticed him and then, you know, I uh, sat down and, you know, was reading and so forth and I tuned out. And then suddenly he goes 
And that then made me look up and notice him. And so that meant that that bird was trying to get attention. He wasn't trying to get my attention, for, per se, but he was trying to get the attention of the opposite sex. Uh, and that's what we mean by mate attraction in this case. Another theory is that uh, vocal learners have the ability to propagate their sounds in different environments. So a pigeon vocalizes best on the ground. Uh, some other bird species vocalize best in the trees or the savanna because of the way they can change the pitch of their vocalizations or the frequency modulation. Uh, whereas non-vocal learning species only can produce sounds best in a particular environment. So <clears throat> uh, this ability of vocal learning allows vocal learners like humans to adapt their vocalizations in uh, an environment that's forever changing. It's thought that humans evolved in the East African Rift Valley uh, in an area roughly 200,000 years ago uh, uh, that became tropics, savanna, desert, and coastline all within a hundred mile radius. And this is one idea is that a complex varying environment could also select for the need to produce vocalizations uh, in different ways. Now you may be asking, well, if mate attraction or rapid adaptation to different uh, uh, sound propagations in different environments uh, is a way to select for vocal learning and all it takes is a few mutations to make a new pathway and a new connection, why isn't it so common? And my hypothesis is that not only are the mates paying attention to you uh, and uh, you know, listening to your songs and not habituating to it when you change it, but so are the predators. And so my hypothesis is that uh, when you produce all these complex different sounds from the top of a tree and advertise yourself and say, hey, look, I can keep switching my sounds and make you pay attention to me, hawk is going to sweep down and eat you, basically. So if you're going to evolve vocal learning abilities, my idea is that that ability also gets heavily selected against. And in support of this hypothesis, a colleague of mine, Kazuo Okonoya, has shown that vocal learning species, bird species kept in captivity for many generations like the Bengalese finch, who have not been selected for songs by humans, sing more complex songs than their wild type counterparts. And guess what? The females of those songbird species, the wild females, prefer the domesticated songs than they do their wild counterparts. And so there is some selection for more complexity once you remove predators away from the species. And all vocal learners amongst mammals, most of them at least, tend to be at the top of the food chain. Humans, elephants, dolphins, whales, and parrots are also quite smart at evading predators. So, but this is a theory still. It's a hypothesis that needs to be tested. So I'm going to end here to say that uh, <clears throat> We've talked about convergent behavior and brain pathways for vocal learning and the associated convergent molecular changes in axon guidance genes like SLIT1, uh, and I didn't talk about other genes but neural protection genes, and the uh, genes that regulate the axon guidance ones like FOXP2. We've also talked about the uh, brain pathways that are controlling ver vocal learning that may have emerged by duplication and divergence from an ancient pathway that controls motor learning, a concept of deep homology, in this case for the brain pathways. This uh, theory helps explain a possible uh, idea, another one, that uh, is thought to be involved in the evolution of speech, that is the gestural hypothesis of speech evolution, where if you may have noticed throughout my entire presentation, if you go back over it, when I talk, I move my limbs. And it's been found that all people move their limbs, particularly their hands, when they talk. Not only that, when you talk in different languages, you move uh, your limbs in a different way. That is, gesturing is learned. And gesturing occurs actually even before you learn how to speak. Chimpanzees can learn how to gesture, but they can't learn how to vocalize. They can learn how to do sign language. And so one idea is that the brain pathways that control gesturing are somehow linked up with the brain pathways that control vocalizations and that they're somehow evolutionary related. And I think my motor theory of vocal learning origin helps explain that. And then finally, I propose um, um, that this mechanism 
of brain pathway duplication and divergence for a new behavior may be a general mechanism for evolution of complex behavioral traits. All this work is not just done by me, but it takes a team of scientists, as you can see here in my lab back in 2010, where uh, uh, we have different people doing different uh, uh, aspects of this work. Uh, for example, um, Ray Wong here discovered uh, the SLIT1 gene is differentially expressed in these cell nuclei along with a collaborator in the lab, Irina Hara. Miriam Rivas was studying some of these genes as well. And uh, we have Osceola Whitney and Andreas uh, Pefning, who were students in the lab and a postdoc, who uh, were also studying how these pathways regulate genes uh, in the brain. That is how vocal learning behavior regulates these genes. So it takes a team effort. And I hope this presentation will inspire other students to ask the questions and work as a team with other scientists who are interested in how the brain controls complex behaviors.